Good morning and welcome. This is Mike Harris on Revolution Radio, and today is Tuesday, November 11th, 2014. And for those of you out there who are aware, this is Veterans Day today. And so, since it is Veterans Day, I, I want to just make a, a, a brief comment before I introduce our guest today. And that is, all you veterans out there, it should be becoming pretty obvious to you that your service is appreciated by your country and by other people. But oftentimes your service was fraudulently gained uh, by our government that tells us lies, that causes false flags, and, and good people, good men, good women have um, you know, sacrificed all for a, a narrative of lies to keep those in power wealthy, to keep those in power happy, to keep those in power healthy, and does nothing for the rest of the people out here, and it's time to end that. So um, I wouldn't recommend military service for anyone under the current uh, paradigm that we live under, no, for, for no one. Uh, just just don't go there. It's not worth it. It's not worth it for your kid. Um, you know, just just don't do it. Anyway, that that's my, my editorializing for the morning. Uh, you know, I think Veterans Day is a tragic day. Um, I, I think it's a day when, you know, uh, people with the best of intentions wanting to serve their country, wanting to serve their people, and to have them just abused and, and misused by uh, the current management or, or past management, it's all part of the same regime, uh, is it, just a heartbreaking tragedy for me. Anyway, uh, that's that being said, let's go ahead and welcome our guest today. Let's welcome Miss Carrie Cassidy of Project Camelot. Carrie, how are you? Hello, Carrie. Hi, hi. <laughs> you yeah, had your microphone muted, didn't you? I do that at least three times a week, so help me God. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I just oh, lost shoot. the microphone for a minute, but here I am. So how you been? Uh, real good. Just uh, incredibly busy over here, uh, just jamming and, and trying to get everything done before I actually leave for Hong Kong and Australia on Friday. Okay, so what, what's the occasion? Why are you going to Hong Kong? Which I really like the city, by the way. Hong Kong's a ton of fun. So why are you going to Hong Kong and Australia? Cool. Uh, well, I was invited by both places to speak. Uh, so I'm speaking in uh, the, at the Hong Kong UFO Conference, and uh, that's on November 30th. And then I am speaking in Australia at what is called the Ambush Gallery, an art gallery uh, in Sydney, Australia, who has invited me to come down and they're going to have a bunch of uh, artists who are painting pictures uh, that are inspired by the Camelot message, I think you, you could say. So, uh, so it's going to be a lot of fun and I'll be in each place, you know, because it's so far to fly, obviously, uh, it takes a number of days to, to, to really get there. <laughs> and uh, I hope I arrive in one piece. I've got a well, well, completely well, from, bizarre from, flight. From, from LAX to Hong Kong, it's about 12 hours. Then from Hong Kong to Australia, you're probably looking at another 12, maybe 14. That's a okay. long flight. That's a yeah. long flight. <laughs> it's a hideous, hideous, hideously yeah. long, old-fashioned, in old-fashioned technology that we shouldn't be even be using, but uh, that's what we're stuck with. If I could take... If I could go the, down the, the, in the Boeing, the Boeing technology, not the teleport technology. <laughs> well, not even that. And and if I could go in into Las Vegas and get on their maglev train and just go over to Pine Gap, I could probably uh, manage to make it to Sydney as well in, on that train. So uh, that would get me there in a couple hours or less. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're you're right. It would, but um, you know. So, <laughs> You'll be flying in a cigar tube. So uh, that's really what an airplane is. I mean, you look at a cigar tube, it's an aluminum tube. What's an airplane? Yes. It's an aluminum tube. It's, uh, right. it, you know, the, the technology I is not that different. I, I call it a tin can. A, a tin can? Well, it's aluminum tubes is what I call it. And uh, you're, you're packed in there like sardines. And yep. uh, hopefully you're flying business class or better. No. But, uh, no, no but you're, oh, well, <laughs> well, well, the good news is you're less than six foot tall. And, and, and you're less than 120 pounds, so it, it probably won't be too tough on you. But when you're a guy my so size, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm right at six foot tall and 210. Uh, those coach seats get kind of tight real fast. Well, it, it's 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 hard for me because I also I'm a, a fidget. I fidget a lot. You know, I, I shift around my seat like a, a crazy person. I mean, I have to uh, sort of sedate myself with things like melatonin and stuff. Uh, uh-huh. 
just because I'm so restless, it's very hard for me to sit uh, in this scrunched sort of way. And I, I don't understand. I have a very bizarre flight, so uh, <laughs> I've uh, I, I I I took the cheapest flight I could find, and I, I just hope I make it there in one piece. <laughs> well, that, that that's the issue. Whenever you fly cheap, you know. Um I, I'll tell you a, a sad story. I, I had a travel agent back when they used to have those. They used to exist. And to save 150 bucks, he had me do a nine-hour layover in uh, the Manila Airport in the Philippines. Oh, no, don't say this. Don't say this. Is a sad story. <laughs> don't say this. Yeah, for 150 I, bucks, yeah. I, I, needless to say, I peeled the bark off him when, when I got home. He's a very nice man. He felt bad about it. But you said get the cheap one. So I did. I said that. So... But but anyway, so, so what else? New, what, what's new with Project Camelot? Uh, your your Mark Phillips interview is up. Um, well, yes, and let me just say, <laughs> you know, I have I have people texting me <laughs> to get your link. So uh, sorry about that. Uh, okay. Um, well, what's new in Project Camelot? Uh, well, you've just ru- ruined my whole day by telling me I'm going to be. <laughs> Way late at the Manila airport. No, 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 no. no. I didn't no. say that. I said that's only happened to me once. Okay, well, but that's where I'm headed, and we are supposed to stay there for uh, a ridiculous amount of time. So I, I, I just figured, okay, I'll see the Philippines. I've never been there, so maybe in, uh, in, in whatever time I have. And anyway, to get back to the subject at hand, uh, wow, there's a lot going on. I have to say, I, I. I don't know how you're seeing seeing it, but I'm just seeing uh, this this whole place kind of exploding with with activity at the moment. Um, not the least of which is the release of my new Mark Richards uh, interview, which I just put out l- late last night, and uh, it's already gotten you know thousands of views, which is awesome, uh, I have to say. But so I I've been Facebooking that that all morning. So, uh, what, what what's new with Mark? <laughs> well, one of the things that uh, <clears throat> excuse me here it's it's morning, so my, my voice isn't all the way up to uh, par yet. But uh, well, he 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 basically says that uh, the Robin Williams death is not a suicide. He was in in close correspondence with him a number of years, and they are old college buddies. Apparently, grew up in the same area. Marin County, and uh, and and so Mark just says that that's not the way Robin would have done it. He 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 simply just wouldn't. Um, he's it's not his style. Uh, that he he his actually his correspondence with Robin was cut off. Uh, in I think he said it was like nineteen. I forget the year. Maybe nineteen eighty nine by by the by the new the re, the more recent wife. Maybe it was later than that. I don't know. Anyway, um, bottom line is that it, it, it's not a suicide. And I have to say that I, I already knew that on an intuitive level, but it's great to meet someone who is an old friend of Robin's who who is coming to the fore to say, um, look, the, this is very suspicious, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, very suspicious circumstances, and uh, and it doesn't it doesn't uh, read well. Mark is, uh, among other things, a very well-trained remote viewer, and uh, trained by the military, and uh, and and so you can probably take that to the bank if if he says it's not a suicide, it's not. And the other thing is that uh, that he he also kind of described his personality, and and this is something I get into in the in the interview sort of description that I talk about, um, and and what it is is that. Robin was a very enlightened soul that even when he was very, very depressed, he would not consider suicide. He wouldn't do that to his family and his children, you know, specifically. And, uh, he also said that, uh, that, that he, he knew the secrets. He knew quite a few secrets. He, um, he did send m- money, uh, to support SETI. Which me, leads me to think that SETI had more going on than just um, something ludicrous like trying to send radio signals out to outer space. They were probably that was probably a cover for something else entirely, um, which is interesting to think about. And uh, 
and yeah, so so it, that's important information, and I hope that it gets out. I hope it gets viral. I know that there are a lot of people uh, that were very touched when they heard the Robin Williams uh, supposedly committed suicide. It didn't ring true, and uh, and and now I have evidence uh, in in the form of a, a very good old college buddy of Robin's, uh, basically saying it's it would does not fit his his personality profile. Hmm. That's, that's, that's been going around a lot, where the, these alleged suicides uh, that are going. You know, I I, I lost uh, a friend uh, last year, JT Reddy, uh, who allegedly committed a murder suicide, murdered his whole family, then killed himself. And absolutely not true. It didn't happen that way. It seems to be one of the favorite ways of covering up uh, an act of violence, a murder. Yes. Yes. And, and well, so I mean, what, we all know uh, what, about Danny Casolaro. I, I have to say that Mark Richards also knew Danny Casolaro, uh, the journalist who was suicided, uh, who was going down the trail of the octopus, as we call it, and uncovering the the trail of money into black projects uh, was the trail he was on several years before Camelot was even in existence, and then they killed him. Um, made it look like a suicide. Uh, most everyone knows it was not a suicide. He was uh, supposed to meet with somebody important and get some very important information, and uh, and so that's where where that's at. But but it is interesting. Mark Richards knew and knows a lot of people, a lot of also very high up people, uh, people high up in the military. Uh, this is a jam-packed interview that I got with him. I have to say, there's a key item uh, with regard to Bobby Ray Inman, and I don't know if you know who he is. Oh, yeah, he was the former director of the CIA, Admiral Bobby Ray Inman. Yes, uh, very, very top guy. Mark says he may know more about what's going on on planet Earth than anyone. That's a, That's a pretty massive statement. He said he worked for him and that he knows him well. Okay. So that's uh, that's key information. Uh and and funny enough, uh on a psychic level, I had tapped into uh, Bobby Ray Inman years ago and I believe even before Camelot, but at any rate during Camelot in the early days, I actually um invited him for an interview, knowing he would turn me down, but but just doing it anyway just to uh send him a signal there. And as it happens, of course, he didn't take me up on it, unfortunately. My offer still stands, by the way, in case he listens to this broadcast. But uh, I have to say that I knew back then that he was uh, one of the key people in this whole scenario of the secret space program, of what's really going on with our relationships with various off-planet and undersea and uh, interdimensional races. <laughs> So, so uh, what what new insights do we have? You said you had. Well, well, first of all, let's step back. Was there any? Uh, did did uh, Mark Phillips have any insight as to what a possible motive could have been for suiciding uh, Robin Williams? Okay, Mark Richards, not Phillips. Mm. Correct. I'm sorry, but my, my, Mark Richards. Thank you for the correction, because Mark Phillips was um, he's related to the Royals <laughs> somehow. It, uh, that's the other captain, Mark, Mark Mark Phillips. He he's the one who plays polo. <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, well, this this Mark uh, Captain Mark Richards is actually in prison for and has been for yes, thirty years. Yes, yes, I know, uh, up in Vacaville. Yes, that's correct. Uh, so I'm um, I'm sorry, you were asking me in in terms of Robin Williams. Uh, what did uh, did he have any possible insights as to a motive for suiciding Robin Williams? Uh, no, he didn't. Uh, so I, I'm not sure what was going on there, but I can say in light of the fact that he knew some secrets and the way they suicided him, which is, uh, if I understand correctly, hanging from a doorknob type of thing. Um, mm -hmm. There's another recent uh, killing that, that took place uh, that had to do with, um, uh, it was a, and I think it was an ex model or a model who uh, supposedly did that to herself, which is completely, you know, ludicrous. Um, this seems to be some kind of Illuminati method of, of killing people just to really um, degrade them in some, some weird way. I mean, you know, you just have to be brain dead to even consider such a thing. But anyway, um, yeah, I mean, he, he would, you know, I, I basically said Illuminati, not hit. I mean, the fact is that Mark is talking about the powers that be and who's in charge here. 
and we're describing in the interview uh, the playing field in depth. Uh, in other words, I'm cover- covering with him when I ask him questions the geopolitical situation out there that includes the off-world races, the various countries that are aligning themselves with different off-world world races and uh, and the, and their motivations. So that's what this all gets back to. But um, knowing that Robin knew Mark should tell you right then and there um, that Robin probably knew a great deal more than they wanted him to know. So, But I don't know what the latest sort of reason was for wanting to, to kill him. One doesn't know what one was up, you know, someone was up to. Uh, I can say that Robin, I think, had just had some kind of um, television show that that might have been uh, just about to go go in, you know, live or whatever, or had just been canceled. I can't remember the exact details, but I do know that um, you know, perhaps he he was coming back into the mainstream. He'd been kind of under the radar for a while. Uh, maybe that was something they didn't want to see happen. Uh, you know, a comedian like him can be extremely dangerous and someone with, with, with the following that he had. Uh, and in light of our current situation here in the world, you can appreciate that are, there, there have got to be a lot of entertainers out there who are now reconsidering their position, uh, as being lapdogs for the Illuminati and, uh, and they must be, you know, they're like everyone else. They have to be learning from the internet, uh, exploring new areas, uh, you know, waking up, their consciousness is waking up, and they may be contemplating all sorts of moves that we are not aware of, and then suddenly they turn up dead. And, um, you know, with the surveillance technology that we're under at the current time, uh, it's not out of the question to, to think that all celebrities, of course, would be, they would be very high on an NSA uh, watch list, let's say. And so any change in behavior, any change in their attitude towards their masters, so to speak, um, all of this stuff is going to be very dangerous because they're already famous. You see what I'm saying? So yeah, if yeah, they yes. start to think differently, <laughs> uh, the, the Apple, wasn't that the yeah. Apple logo? Think differently. If they start to think differently, uh, they are going to be a threat and they will be able to move very quickly and this, so this is a, if there's any celebrities out there who are listening to this, and I wouldn't be a bit surprised if that were the case, uh, then I, I, I'm talking to you. I'm basically saying, you know, hey, Michael Jackson was, was suicided, as we call him. Uh, he was killed. Um, there are a number of, uh, Whitney Houston, another one, uh, and, and, and the list goes on, uh, and you can also ta- uh, look at my interview with Ole Damagard, uh, a person who investigates conspiracies around the globe. Uh, fascinating guy who has, uh, who wrote Coup d'etat in Motion, I believe is the name of the book. Fascinating free ebook, uh, that's just, uh, just all about the, the death of, of, uh, their, their prime Minister of Sweden, um, Palma, I think was his his last name, if I recall. Mm-hmm. At any rate, the point being is that we're talking about a, a person, a celebrity who has what you might call, um, you know, and 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 uh, what's his name, uh, Brand Russell Brand. I mean, is a perfect example. Going off the reservation, you know, what I mean, this is dangerous to the Illuminati in a way that that you or I can't even conceive of, and yet. We are like sort of uh, low low level c- celebrities in our own right, right? But mm. at the same time, we're you know look, we don't garner the kind of audience that a Michael Jackson would. So you can appreciate the threat of of one of those people waking up, starting to think for themselves, and starting to want to get new information out, wake people up. Uh, they could be a force that would just uh, be nonstop, just like a rocket. Well, there, there, there's something else in this as well. And you know, one thing that everyone I've ever met really, really, really hates is they hate being played. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? They, they, yeah. they hate being played. And if these celebrities, uh, if these people who, who have fame, who have fortune, who've been part of uh, you know, the, the Hollywood scene or, or, or whatever, if they wake up and figure out, I've been played, 
they've used me like a tool. That's I, right. I, I'm the fool. Not only do, do you have them with knowledge and with a listener base, but now you've got somebody who's highly motivated to even the score, to, to rectify the injustice that's been that, done to them. That. And in some cases, you know, they've been pressured. Uh, they've been unduly pressured uh, and possibly even uh, had to t- participate in things that they didn't believe in, uh, all, all in the name of career. Well, a person like that is already on an edge, and all they need is a little push, and, uh, and they could come over to the good side, so to speak, and start, uh, start disclosing. And if that should happen, just think if it happens with one. But then what if it happens with ten? Ten well-known personalities suddenly coming forward and saying, yes, E.T. is here. Yes, the military has known about it. Yes, they made deals with them. Yes, some of them are not friendly. Uh, and, and the list goes on. Um, you've got a whole different playing field out there. It, overnight, literally overnight. We don't need the president, okay, to be disclosing that, yes, E.T. is here. None of that bullshit. I'm sorry for my French here, but... Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> the bottom line is we, we don't need that, okay? All we need is 10 good celebrities, not just good men, but good men and women to step up, to get awake, and to suddenly decide that the reality is more important than their fracking, you know, paycheck. And their fame isn't going to deteriorate as a result. In fact, it'll probably skyrocket. It'll, it'll expand. It, it will expand. They're, they're, they'll become more <laughs> famous than ever. And, and particularly so if, it, if they have credible it, it evidence or contemplate. And who would have thought that my contact with Captain Mark Richards of the Secret Space Program, a guy in jail for 30 years framed on a murder he did not commit, would would know Robin Williams so well that he could come forward and say this was not a suicide. I mean, I hope that Robin Williams' family is listening to this broadcast. I, I, it's probably doubtful, but maybe he woke up his kids. Maybe they're hip to stuff. Maybe they know things they're not saying. You know what I'm saying? I mean, uh, that's a tragedy when uh, uh, someone is misled about something in regard to a close loved one, loved one like that. And then all the fans that have just been heartbroken because <clears throat> Robin's no longer with us and, and he was so loved. And so this is this is important stuff. This is really... Amazing, and and what it means is that, you know, uh, six degrees of separation is is slowly narrowing. <laughs> so, well, you know, for for a long time there there's been many 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 um, suicides in in the Hollywood scene for you know, decades going back now, and right. there there's, there's been this rumor out there that there is this uh, a hidden mafia. That uh, that dictates and controls the celebrities in their lives, what they can talk about, what they can't talk about, and how that they have the illusion of great wealth, but they're not allowed to keep any of it. Uh, all of these things, uh, you know, that there, there's that's been like the dark underbelly of uh, of uh, of Hollywood for a long time. Absolutely. Well, uh, you know, now's the time for change because, uh, like I say, I believe these people, some of them have been party to big secrets. Some of them have been friendly with people that would give them information. Uh, even, you know, past presidents that have died, uh, if you knew one of those presidents. It's interesting to me because when I talk to Mark Richards, uh, he lets me know that Congress and members of Congress, as much as we've been told by a lot of whistleblowers even, that uh, government officials are not in the know, uh, and therefore it, on a certain level when you think they're not in the know, you're, you're excusing their behavior, um, twist that around for a minute and, and consider that they might actually know what's going on and not be talking about it. Because that, that puts a level of responsibility on Congress people, on, uh, on even flunkies within the White House, uh, you know, people working at military bases around the world. You look, they, they're not living in a fish tank, an I- isolated, you know, uh, private Idaho anymore. The internet has brought all of this stuff to the fore. Uh, these people have to have stumbled on, on truths, uh, in, in their midst. And can you imagine military bases have to be full of people 
that have seen things, heard things, and know, first of all, that we're being visited. Second of all, that there are battles taking place with ET races. I mean, you know, wrap your mind around that. Being a a so-called flunky in a, a military situation where you're nowhere close to the top of the food chain, and yet you know something that could change the world. So that's what we have to do is enable these people to come forward and speak out. And Carrie, we've got our first break at the bottom of the hour here. We'll be right back in a few minutes, folks. More with Carrie Cassidy of Project Camelot. Stick with us. Be right back. Good morning. Welcome back. This is Mike Harris on Revolution Radio. Today is Tuesday, November 11th, 2014. Veterans Day for everyone um, out there to, to give thanks to those who served our country. And, you know, regardless of the result, you have to admire the intention of those who serve. And uh, they, they write a blank check to the government. And it's just too bad that our, our government has proven itself unworthy of, of the trust and the, uh, the confidence that, uh, that the American people have given it. That, that's really a shame. And, um, you know, that we've been infiltrated by people who, who don't have our best means at heart. And really, for the first time, I think, in our history, we have truly domestic enemies to deal with here. But I digress. My, my guest today is Carrie Cassidy of Project Camelot. Carrie, welcome back. Hi, Mike. Uh, well, actually, along those lines, let me say that Mark Richards had something to say about veterans and about the current uh, troops that are supposedly being deployed to places like Iraq and Afghanistan. And what he said is that there are a large number of them, don't even know it, but they are being stationed uh, off planet. And they come back and they've had their minds wiped several times. And that this is why we have such a high rate of suicide, that there, those suicides are actually individuals who can't put their minds around where they've been, what their, what their memories are, uh, because they have no support out there whatsoever. And he said that the Veterans Administration has, uh, does the numbers of their, the people that they have, uh, supposedly, supposedly on their records don't match the troop numbers, uh, of actual deployments. And, uh, that that's one of the places that you can tell that there's something very askew going on. And uh, that was fascinating and relates directly to a recent interview I did with Captain K, uh, also known as Randy Kramer, uh, a Marine who, who, who believes he was based uh, for 20 years uh, off-planet on Mars and the Moon. Well, you know, that, that's interesting. I mean, particularly if you look at, uh, let's, let's call it a, a ledger sheet that doesn't balance. If you've got uh, <laughs> more troops deployed than you have in the service, uh, you know, how, how does that work? You know, I mean, uh, explain that to me under generally accepted accounting practices, would you? I mean, that's, a, that, that's an interesting one there. But well, we've got it's a, kind of like off off uh, off ledger balance sheets uh, that we're very familiar with at this point, uh, uh, pertaining to the money that's flowing into the secret space program, and uh, so that's a whole whole nother discussion. But just just not to lose the thread here, uh, you know, you have to wrap your mind around the idea that, and I meet these people. Let me say this: I meet people who are also being utilized by the secret space program. And don't even know it, uh, especially young men who uh, s sort of exude a certain uh, amount of knowledge. They don't know where it came from, and uh, and what they don't know is is they are are being utilized even in the astral. Interesting, very interesting. Over the break, I got a number of uh, emails and things about. Uh, different people who've been suicided. Uh, Mick Jagger's girlfriend, Loren Scott, fashion designer, was suicided. A, a gentleman named Aaron Russo, uh, who uh, made a... Uh, excuse me. <coughs> who were suicided. You know, th th this is a, a sensitive topic here when we talk about what's going on in Hollywood. You know, why do you think Hollywood experiences so much of this type of, of, uh, of, of uh, um, incidents? Well, I, I mean, again, it gets back to what we're talking about. Uh, these people garner uh, a great deal of power, like it or not. Uh, I think it was Beyonce recently released her album uh, in, a, in a sort of what was a quasi-unconventional fashion in, in that she didn't notify um, or use her, her publicity machine. She just 
put it on the internet. <laughs> uh that was that was how she chose to do it uh now whether or not that that was just an orchestrated event beyond the scenes i don't know i like to think that maybe she was trying to make some kind of statement there um even in in a small way but the power of the individual has now really come to the fore as you can appreciate in other words this sort of vehicle this internet that connects all of us round the clock uh, also allows us, without any sort of, um, what do you call, gatekeepers, to keep us out of the, of the eye of the public. We are in the eye of the public if we choose to be. And if we, we know how to, to uh, whether we do our own radio show or we, we are, are good writers or whatever the, the skill set of the person is. And um, so, so just take that on a celebrity level and magnify that um, – you know, umpteen number of times. And you've really got a person who, if they went on the internet tomorrow and utilized, uh, social media the way I utilize it, for example, uh, this stuff would go viral in seconds around the world and they could put anything on there if they so chose. So you can imagine that the Illuminati are now wanting to tighten the reins and the mind control over their their sort of star stars the stars that are out there that they manage and are con- in control of and so they are like a loaded gun at this moment uh one move it it just takes one move a couple of seconds and um and and information is released that is power and that is power of the individual and uh again this gets back to what we're talking about here all we need we probably don't even t- need 10 celebrities all we probably need is five, to be honest, uh, who will just be honest and go forward and tell what they really know. And, uh, the ones that have been party to knowing more than, than the mind controlled, uh, masses of celebrities. And, uh, and you've got a whole different ball game on earth, uh, the, the next day, literally. So they can't even kill you fast enough. I mean, can you wrap your mind around that? Well, th- this is the good news here, Carrie, is that people have more power than they realize. I mean, you look at the Hollywood propaganda machine, and it's been spending the last 50, 60 years convincing us, trying to make us believe that we are powerless, that we have no power, that we need to depend on them, that we need to to depend on the state, on the authorities, in order to to seek justice or to have any sort of a a chance at all in this world. And, And it's not true. We have the power. We always have. Uh, they've been, like I said, trying to beat it out of us uh, for, for 50, 60 years now. Well, no doubt about it. I, I mean, the, the fact of the matter is that people are waking up to that realization, and they have been now for a number of years. This isn't news, you know what I'm saying? Uh, <laughs> and, and, and so that being the case, and people are acting according to... Accordingly, I mean, the bottom line is that, I mean, you know, Camelot started in a time when, when we were virtually the only people that would take a, a camera, a consumer grade camera, and go around the world interviewing whistleblowers. Uh, now interviewing whistleblowers is, is really the flavor of the month. Uh, <laughs> I have to say, um, there's so many people out there with interviews and this and that. Um, some good, some not so good, but, you know, this is the, the name of the game. Uh, people are realizing, yes, their own power. Uh, radio is another example. Uh, you know, you can have your own radio show in, in, in five minutes. Uh, there's so many vehicles to do that with. Uh, it's, it's mind blowing. You don't need to be on a network. Uh, you know, current company, uh, excluded. <laughs> not, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, uh, don't and, give me the then, trouble here, okay? I like these also, guys. <laughs> sorry. And then there's also the opportunity to create your own network. And, uh, and, and that's something that, uh, <laughs> that certain people may, may actually be contemplating at this time, uh, without names being given. And so, you know, they become an immediate threat. Um, you know, we are a threat when we're awake and that's just a reality so um so again get ba- getting back to the sort of robin williams and this the whole suicided idea people that are well known uh need to also wake up to the fact that they have tools at their disposal to wake others up in seconds and if they will be uh use courage and come forward um we're all going to be stronger 
you know, we're only as strong as our weakest link. Have you heard that saying? Uh, you know, that's the bottom line. We need to, we need to work together because we are in this together. And, uh, that gets back to my latest release, uh, the Mark Richards interview. What is important about those interviews? And now I've done three of them with him is not only, of course, the information, but the overall sort of, um, stance, which has to do with both understanding that there is a battle going on there for sovereignty of earth, for sovereignty of humanity that surpasses uh, borders here on the planet, but doesn't um, doesn't sort of deny the fact that there are still factions on earth, some of which are uh, sort of aligned with certain borders in certain ways. But bottom line is that our governments are backed by these alien races, that our politics are not just politics here on the ground on planet earth, but they are politics on and off the planet. So if you do something on Earth, I know that this might be hard for people to wrap their minds around. It it has, uh, you know, basically an echo that goes out into space and affects those races, affects relationships between those races and between the races and humans. And so we've got a, a playing field that people do not acknowledge on a daily basis. And it's time we did because our power goes beyond Earth. If you can, if you can, you know, sort of take that on board. Well, it it does actually, and, and you know, thoughts resonate out there, and feelings resonate out there, and, and you project them. And granted, they're subject to the inverse square law of the propagation of light. The more distant they become, the weaker they become. But uh, still, cumulatively, uh, it 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 does. It has an effect. There's a there's a very very profound effect, and it goes back to the old discussion about the hundredth monkey. And, you know, how does that, that phenomena occur? But it does. And, and the, the, the thoughts that we have affect those around us all the time. No doubt about it. Uh, well, actually, we learn by osmosis and, uh, and, and we are sending out signals with our brains constantly. We are senders and receivers. Uh, and, and what resonates in the heart goes further than, than what is simply, uh, sort of locked in the mind, so to speak. Uh, so that's important to understand. In other words, when I speak, the, the fact that I have a unity between my mind and my heart makes my words more powerful and they resonate more out there in the public. And I got to say that when I, I speak in front of people, they come up to me and they say, look, um, we know that you are telling the truth. Uh, and what they're getting is what resonates. And uh, all the time people are only given the intellectual side of that argument. I, I think it's very important that we start to recognize the role the heart plays and the emotions and how we are, are far more complex than they have given us credit for. Humanity, when united, is a real force to be reckoned with. And with that knowledge, uh, coupled with what we were just talking about in terms of, you know, having seconds, you can change the world in a matter of seconds if you reach enough people quickly enough. So that's, uh, that's a powerful thought. It's, it's powerful just in and, in and of itself. And, uh, it tells you that the individual is very, very strong at this moment. And this is part of the reason why as our consciousness rises, their efforts to clamp down, uh, escalate as well. And I want to say that uh, I don't know if this is correct, but someone out there maybe can verify it. I, I, someone's saying that the, the Patriot Act, the principles within the Patriot Act, uh, has just gone global, whatever that means. Uh, apparently there's a video making the rounds. Um, I'm not sure what act the UN has passed, but this is really interesting because the United Nations, according to Mark Richards, uh, a certain portion of the United Nations, including the head of the United Nations are completely read in on the ET reality. And they know uh, the political games being played on planet Earth. They know which races are positive and which, which are not, uh, it, as well as anyone can know, uh, you know, as, and that, and that's a changing game, as you can appreciate. But in other words, wrap your mind around the idea that if there is, you know, if they are putting out, uh, sort of laws or so-called laws, the, the UN, uh, that body, um, UNESCO, according to Mark Richards, has always known and was established to deal with the off-planet races, 
to uh, to give away underground bases uh, or sell them or trade them uh, with with off planet races. They are actually fully involved. I mean, this is this is stuff that's just not out there. But if you wrap your mind around that, then you understand that there's something completely a different game being played on Earth than most people will acknowledge, and it's time they did. Well, th- there's another aspect here. Most people don't realize that the UN has a dedicated office for exopolitics. They've got a director. They, they've got you know they, they've got staff. Uh, to just deal with off-world, off-planet issues, and if if they didn't have someone to deal with, that office wouldn't exist. <laughs> it's a no-brainer. It's and a so, no-brainer. Uh, let me say that that MJ12. We talked about MJ12. Uh, he also said they are reporting to to someone above them. Uh, it's very important to start to uh, take all this on board and and to look at news items with a completely different eye. Because when you start to, uh, you know, even reading Gordon Duff's latest article uh, about uh, China and uh, and their role with regard to their um, alliances with various races who may be hostile to uh, the rest of us here on planet Earth, um, this is important. It's important because there are elements within China that are fighting against that. But there are certainly elements that, um, it, you know, according to Mark Richards and according to uh, Gordon Duff and other people that are out there in the know and talking about this sort of thing, um, we've got a government in China that has billions of people or control, supposed control over billions, who is aligned with a race that, that may not have our best interests in mind. That impacts the entire earth. That's not just China's business, Okay. Um, that means that when you see a news item in which Russia is aligning itself with China, we've got a problem, okay, <laughs> Scotty? Uh, you know, you know what I'm saying? I mean, uh, when you, when you hear that China is making a move and making an alliance with, I don't know, you know, some pipeline deal, supposed pipeline deal, uh, the ramifications go much beyond what we currently look at when we, when we hear news. And so it's time to start, you know, peeling back those layers and start wrapping it into a global, off-world, you know, uh, interplanetary concept of what's really going on here. We are in a political game with off-planet races and pl- and races underground and undersea, uh, inner Earth, uh, and so on. So, so nobody. None of these races are, are just operating, uh, in an isolated fashion. If they're interacting with Earth, uh, they're, they're something to be considered. And their intentions towards us and towards our future are, are not going to always be, uh, totally transparent, I can guarantee you. Uh, politics on, you know, as above, so below. Well, let me ask you this about that, since, since nobody's published a program yet about who are the good guys, who are the bad guys. What Nobody even knows what the objects of the game are. Can you give us some insight onto that? Who are the good races? Who are the bad races? What are Do you, do you have any insights at all as, as to what they're trying to accomplish here? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, I can say that because of my eight and a half years in, in Camelot and the whistleblowers I have been in contact with, that I've got a, a fair understanding, uh, probably better than many, but I wouldn't say all, and certainly um, not better than those who are already read in, in on certain levels of the secret space program. And uh, also we're talking corporations, corporations that are making deals with off-planet races, even um, that may be against uh, the, the races that are running our government <laughs> and or uh, some of the, the, the more positive sides of the, of the ET equi- you know, sort of quotient. Um, yeah, sure. I mean... In the Mark Richards interview, that's what's interesting about talking to him is that he fully was engaged as a pilot of what's called an Orion vehicle that is in essence uh, a sort of starship enterprise, if you will, uh, that does battle um, and and doesn't land on on planet Earth, doesn't even refuel here. and there's said to be at least 12 of these, these ships, uh, and I would, I would estimate a lot more than that. And then when you get into different sizes, you've got a whole fleet of, of things, which is Solar Warden, which is what Gary McKinnon stubbled on, but 
I digress. So back to uh, what are the races? Reptoids uh, are a, a branch, apparently a branch that, that branched off from what are called raptors. And the raptors uh, had to leave Earth uh, 65 million years ago. Apparently during a, a cataclysm, they uh, they terraformed and took over a, a planet in the Draco system, but they consider Earth their original home. They have aligned themselves with us. So the raptors have aligned them, themselves with us, according to Mark Richards, who knows them well and deals with them even now. Uh, uh, and and that, that poses an interesting question as to why he's in prison in the first place. And then what used to be, uh, I guess, a related race, which is now called the reptoids, uh, some of which are humanoid, have huge bases, Mark says, in, in Africa, for one thing. And uh, then there's the, the race from Aldebaran, which helped the Nazis. This is well documented. Um, and they are, uh, I would say they are not necessarily our friends. They're friends of, uh, of, of those who would be aligned with the Nazi bloodline, uh, apparently. Uh, but even then, I, I probably wouldn't trust them as far as I could throw them. I mean, you well, know, what, what, type of, what type of yeah. aliens are there? I mean, you know, we, you know, uh, these ones from Aldebaran. What type of aliens are there? Are these like the tall whites? What are they? The, they are not the tall whites, uh, and and that's another thing we talked about. But we can get into that. Uh, the bottom line is that those from Aldebaran are said to be um, to to be looking like your traditional Nordic or sort of Nazi, you know, well built, uh, tall, light haired uh, type of persona at least that's how they're described uh but there's also a race that are reptilian from aldebaran uh so different you know planetary systems will have different races and this is also where humans get very confused um they all it, it apparently you you know there's someone on on veterans today who i'm trying to get uh his atten- attention because uh preston james uh because he's he's apparently confused the tall whites, who Charles Hall wrote, wrote about, who are a very um, sort of peaceful race, actually. If you don't mess with them, they don't mess with you. And they're very well described in Charles Hall's books. Um, and I highly re- recommend those books for anyone interested. Um, I've tried to get an interview with him, and his wife is also his handler, and so far has pre- pre- prevented that from happening. But uh, there's a mix. Some people are confused. That race is not the same as the, the race from Aldebaran. Hmm, okay. Well, it, it, regardless, Preston James was my guest yesterday. I speak to him almost every day, so I will pass your message along to him and have him awesome. contact you. And, you know, let me say that I think Preston James is a wonderful writer. Uh, I think he, he's a very good guy. Um, but just, you know, he, not everyone has their facts right. I mean, uh, this is... No, this I, I, I understand it, and he'll take it and like it, uh, because he wants to be accurate. Anyway, folks, we're at the top of the hour. We'll be right back after this short break. More with Carrie Cassidy of Project Camelot. Stick with us. Be right back. Good afternoon. Welcome back. This is Mike Harris on Revolution Radio. Today is Tuesday, November 11th, 2014. My guest today is Carrie Cassidy of Project Camelot. Carrie, welcome back. Thanks, Mike. How you doing? Hey, I'm doing okay for a middle-aged white guy. You know, what can I, what can I say? I, I got to count my blessings and, uh, you know, keep on keeping on. Yep. I hear you there. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I mean, it's, uh, it's, life is not easy for anybody right now. You know, I was, uh, I was looking over, um, s- some things here, um, you know, our, our economy in the U.S. And, you know, some of the things we look at there, they're talking about how, how much the economy has improved and all this. And it's nonsense. And, you know, you look at, you know, my sector, which is the technology sector that I've got a, uh, a lot of interest in, you know, I mean, Hewlett Packard cut 5,000 jobs in October, bringing its yearly total loss to 21,000. Microsoft, uh, Microsoft eliminated another 6,509 jobs in October, year to date layoffs of 55,511. Uh, the electronics industry overall cut 1,648, bringing the year-to-date job loss to 18,153. Telecommunications, 5,217. Year-to-date loss, 20,038. 
you know, and you, you look at what our job losses in the tech sector have been. Job losses have risen by 97% over the previous year. And, uh, you know, th- that's not, you know, a, a good way for this country to be going. I, I, I think that we're, you know, the, the more I, I study it, the more I'm convinced that we're on the verge of a, of a U.S. financial meltdown here. But I, I digress from the topics. Uh-huh. Okay, well, as far as the meltdown goes, uh, yeah, I, I know, I hear the, uh, I hear the news. Uh, I mean, that just gets wrapped into a larger picture of what they're really trying to orchestrate, and it's not just the United States, it's global. Uh, and, and really, it, it all is based on, you know, who we're warring with and under what circumstances and, and who is sort of in control and who isn't. Um, there is a large contingent that wants to take down the United States because it has been uh, a bastion of what's left of freedom on the planet in terms of the way the people think. And, uh, you know, if you think you're free, you, you probably are free on a certain level. So um, whether you like it or people out in, you know, Europe, and I travel all over the world, and I can tell you that um, because we were raised with the idea that we we are free, uh, and we actually believed it, in spite of the evidence to the contrary, uh, when you look at our government and, and the kind of laws they pass, uh, especially lately, um, you know, the bottom line is that we act as though we are free. And if you act as though you are free, uh, then chances are you're going to to be a lot more powerful than if, if you uh, if you go around with hanging your head, uh, you know, and and saying you're beat up every day. So um, so that makes they, that makes the citizens of the United States uh, potentially dangerous uh, because they are not uh, willing to sort of um, toe the line. Uh, they are keeping their guns and uh, they are not being deceived by all the false flags that are put in motion to try to make them give up their guns. Um, and that, that means that, that any, uh, invading race, such as, uh, the Chinese or the people they work for or whoever, uh, simply are not going to be able to take this country easily. We're not going to go laying down. And, um, and so when you say global meltdown or you say, you know, financial meltdown, I have to say this stuff is orchestrated. It is orchestrated using artificial intelligence, um, and they have been planning this stuff using uh, advanced computers and advanced artificial intelligence uh, now for years. How they choose to do it uh, is another matter because we are not privy to uh, you know each move that they're going to make. I do know that there's a great deal of propaganda out there. There's a great deal of energy put into getting people to take their eye off the power they have now, in the now, and to think in terms of the future. If you think about it, if you put all your energy into prepping and and going underground now, when in fact you could be out there changing the world, um, you know, wrap your mind around that. Uh, so the prepper movement uh, is 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 a sort of double-edged sword, in my opinion, which isn't to say that I don't acknowledge that people need to be prepared, but I think that what happens is the bunker mentality that goes along with that preparation is a very dangerous uh, sort of concept, and it is a way of disempowering humanity because it focuses on a future that is negative. And when you're doing that, you are not acting in the now in a positive way to create a positive future necessarily. So, um, you know, uh, this is not a direct qu- criticism of the preppers, but it is a, ca- a word of caution to, to people not to uh, take their eye off the power in their hands today to, uh, to, to uh, change the world and the people around them. No, I, I agree with you. But I also think it's prudent. It, it's sort of like, uh, you know, I don't want to have to spend money on car insurance. 
But you know what? I'm kind of glad I have it in case uh, some illegal alien runs a red light while he's drunk and hits me or something. I can get my car fixed. You know, it's it's one of those kind of things. You know, but uh, you know, I, I I prep a bit and you know I've got you know water stored and food stored and guns and ammunition. But I still come out here every day and, and do the same job and try to get people to 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 wake up and you know I I work hard and you I've got to compliment you as being one of the first movers on this about being actively involved in deconstructing the narrative of lies that keep the power structure in place. Uh, I'm ready to see this whole thing collapse so that we can rebuild one from the ground up the way we like it, the way we need it to be. (laughs) Yes, I I agree with you. Uh, You know, it's just uh, someone here is... um is, is just letting me know that uh, the article that I, I posted of, of Gordon's apparently about the black goo and China was uh, from quite a while ago, apparently. Um, yeah, it was almost two years ago. It was resent to me, I have to say. It came into my email today. So uh, it looks like they repost their articles from time to time. Um, well, Gordon maybe. did, and he put the uh, the term Redux up there, R-E-D-U-X, so that you knew it was a repost. But I, I, I still think the article is as valid as it ever was. And I want to circle back to something else Gordon said. And, and you're, you're privy to this conversation where Gordon commented that uh, Africa is going to be depopulated to make room for a billion off-world people to come here and move. And I think that's the deal that China's got, got working here because China is all over Africa right now. They, you can't go anywhere w- without bumping into the Chinese. And so I, I really think that that's, uh, that's China's deal that they've cut. And uh, I think other people are aware of it. But I, I think that's that's what we're getting ready uh, to prepare for here. Well, along those lines, again, back to my Mark Richards interview, as it happened, we discussed that very thing. Uh, I ran that whole story by him, uh, and this is not the first time I've discussed that with him, but he, he did have some clear things to say. He said that uh, that he doesn't believe we're giving away the continent of Africa, per se, to uh, what is, in essence, the, uh, the, Al- the race from Aldebaran. Uh, but that, it, as a matter of fact, what we are doing is giving them very, very large bases in Africa. Um, so, uh, you know, it's it's a sort of partial yes to that to that whole concept. Um, you know, I, it, it may be a question of semantics when you say you're you're giving away a country. Uh, that may just be a sort of a, a blanket statement that has more nuances. Uh, but yes, you're right. Uh, the, the Chinese are definitely the Chinese are said to be the uh, have have decided to be the administrators of this uh, this sort of takeover of Africa. And uh, and Mark also said that Ebola is a is is a, a bioweapon targeted at um, destroying very large reptoid bases under Africa. And that's why Ebola has been created. That it's. Uh, the collateral damage may be to also uh, target certain other humans, but he says the, uh, the that he he he's convinced, and his contacts are telling him that this is a targeted hit at underground, under Africa reptoid bases. So that's would, that's key. Would that explain why they did everything they could do to import Ebola into this country instead of leaving it in Africa? <laughs> Well, uh, well, it's very possible. I, I mean, I can say that, you know, we're dealing with the reptoids here. Uh, in fact, I believe that they are, uh, they have infiltrated not only our government, but also the uh, secret space program in a, in a ma- major way. And uh, aspects of that, our military is what that, that means. So um, I wouldn't be surprised. Okay, Gordon references in that article about the Black Triangles that the Chinese have uh, reached an alliance with an off-world race that has a Mongol-type, uh, you know, appearance, visage, and all that. What, what race would that be, and where are they from? Do you have any insights on that? Because I don't. Uh, no, I, but I do know that you know I had a whistleblower quite a while ago and had reported that information uh, that China was dealing with a relatively new race on the block, so to speak. Uh, that was not um, friendly to, uh, to to many humans out there, um, you know, many of us, and that, that they were uh, they're making threats along those lines. So um, I don't know the exact physical description of the race, the Chinese races. Actually, they uh, Mark says they're dealing with three. 
And it does not appear that all three of them are what we call um, service to self negative oriented races. However, uh, there may be a major race that has come to the fore that is 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 a negative race. Now, when you talk about Mongol uh, genetics, it doesn't necessarily mean they have that appearance. Um, although, uh, one time I did have a whistleblower talk to me about a certain race that is appearing to be um, of sort of Chinese descent uh, that is not necessarily uh, from here, as he put it. And um, and we had an interesting incident in which I was at a cafe and uh, there was an operation conducted around me and a friend of mine in which her cell phone um, – had been handed to me, uh, and they had, that we had been, uh, sort of stalked by this sort of group of, of what appeared to be Chinese type, uh, appearing individuals, and, um, then they stole her cell phone. Uh, unbeknownst to them, they, they thought it was my cell phone because, uh, she had handed it to me and I hand, I put it down on a, on a chair at our table. And they conducted a very skillful little operation in which there were at least three of them. And, uh, and one of them went by our table and, and grabbed it faster than we could even move and, uh, and, and, and went off with it. And, uh, that, that was a very interesting dynamic. Hmm. Interesting. So, um, you know, what, what do we hear new from, from this mantoid race? Is there anything going on with them that, they're they're the uh, the insectoid type ones, correct? If I yes, uh, they they they're called. Uh, w- from my understanding, they're actually a combination of the mantids and an ant-like race, or they look like a combination of that. Uh, and and Mark Richards refers to them as the trogs. Now he says that race is uh, is actually um, very nefarious and has a very sort of negative agenda towards earth and towards humans um, but they are appearing to be uh, our friends so supposedly to various uh, contactees and, uh, and and there is some question as to whether or not uh, Simon Parks is aware of, of exactly what race I'm talking about or whether we're talking about two different races and I want to be careful there because again when you lump all the races together and their agendas as well, um, not to mention that within a race of beings, just like humans, you can get factions that are positive and other factions that are very negative in their intentions. Um, but they will have sort of, you might say, a racial imperative that, you know, uh, just as humans eat uh, eat meat, we, we eat, they, uh, you know, cows and so on, uh, those, those beings eat humans. Mm-hmm. Okay. This is this is the mantoid types. Uh, this is a, a a race again that ro- that is called the trogs by Mark Richard. Uh, they are a combination apparently of mantid and ant like beings, but they look to I guess most people like what are called praying mantises. So so insect like uh, regardless. So yeah, but they're nine feet tall. So yeah, so. Um, so it re- reminds me of Robert Heinlein's book, uh, Starship <laughs> Troopers, that they made a movie out of. You know, I mean, if uh, in particularly if, if they're insect-like and if they could reproduce in such prodigious numbers, where they're laying ten thousand eggs in a day, uh, that's that, that that's quite an advantage that they have because we as humans, one of our 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 disadvantages is the fact that we breed slow takes nine months of gestation and then to get a human to maturity is another 18 years this is a a a very very slow process in comparison to what other uh races may be able to do well yes but that also gets into another matter i mean what's interesting about my interviews with mark richards is that he is willing to talk about the things that you know even people that are disclosing as as witnesses out there pretty much won't touch and that is how often off-planet races are using us, they say, he says, uh, especially, well, obviously, for, uh, human women for breeding purposes, as he puts it. Uh, they can, they are putting uh, reptilian eggs in women uh, that they, they take off-planet and uh, using them as, as places to, I guess, um, breed more. And and so I'm not sure what goes on there, but I can say that uh, 
that according to Mark Richards, that taking humans off planets, uh, that using them as slaves, using them for food, using them, uh, the women as breeders, as he calls it, et cetera, is uh, a, a big part of, of the scenario from what he talks about. Now, this may be one of the biggest secrets out there and something that no one wants to touch. Now, of course, we know that our own Illuminati are um, are doing some some very um, dreadful acts in that regard on a regular basis as well. So one might look at their heritage and wonder where uh, their their racial lines come from. Uh, it, it does make sense in a certain way. Well, well, so something has occurred to me. Um, and this was just a, a thought that I had. You know, you, you wake up in the middle of the night, and you've got these passing thoughts. You know, at, at the end of World War II, um, you know, Caucasians were approximately 30 percent of the global population. It's down to about a little less than 8 percent, where we're, we're, you know, seven in a fraction right now. And it, it seems to be that there is an effort to uh, to genocide you know white people off the face of the earth and this goes back to a bloodline issue that is the white race losing its uh uh its position and why and and who's interfering with this uh off world if you will since this is an off world race a uh, off world uh uh situation if you will there there's they're interfering in our politics on a, on a daily basis sure uh well i mean there are various aspects to that question and yeah, I can say that it's obvious that there is interference, but there's also a strong contingent, as I was saying. Um, in other words, if our young men are also being recruited to to fight wars for alien races off planet, uh, it, another thing he talked about was the idea that they are actually um, being paid, being bribed, and going off world and being given uh, other cities to live in, other places where they were get, are given all the luxuries they could possibly want. At the same time, they are fighting off planet uh, for for various races. So, uh, you know, what is the color of the skin? If you want to get into that kind of thing, what is the bloodline of those races they're taking off planet? Um, then there's the whole the whole underground base scenario. There's there's uh, the base on Mars. Uh, I understand we have a substantial base on Titan, the moon Titan, um, and and so on. And a lot of that will be uh, very likely white uh, or Anglo-Saxon or whatever as being part of a bloodline that is is related certainly to what what I know of as uh, basically the Anunnaki, but uh, but may go by other names uh, depend, depending who we're talking about. So yeah, it's a complex, it's a very complex story, and uh, and and may may also play into why uh, certain races are taking predominance at this time on planet Earth. It's not so superficial as one might think. Well, let me ask another question since you uh, brought up the Mars base. Uh, have you heard anything about the uh, the destruction of the of the U.S. base on Mars? I mean, there was some uh, YouTube video out a, a week or two ago showing a very large eruption on on the surface of the planet. Have you uh, heard anything about that, or is that anything that that's come across your desk? Uh, absolutely, and uh, and that's in the Mark Richards interview that I I just published as well. Uh, he he says. Uh, that, that, and actually intuitively I had already published, uh, my intuitive take on that because I was getting that it was not an explosion on the surface at all. Actually what it was was, uh, you know, it was the comet flyby and the comet was targeted to, uh, at Mars, uh, very likely at our base on Mars, but it never got close enough. They shot it, uh, so it, it, it actually had to, it steered it away from the planet. So the impact and, and where the, the flash, that is shown on that video is uh, is actually coming from uh, from targeting it. Either we shot it, or or uh, an alien race that is protecting that Mars base shot at it um, and redirected that comet away from the planet. So our Mars base is okay. Uh, yes. I'm sorry, let me rephrase this: the, the, the U.S. secret space program's Mars base is okay. I have no <laughs> affiliation with it. I've never been. Yes. There. They haven't even sent me a photograph, not a postcard, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yes. But so it's it's the it's the U.S. secret space program's Mars base is okay. 
Yes, from so. from what I understand. I mean, it is interesting. Uh, you know, there is an aspect to what Mark is doing where he has uh, he's he seems right up on the news and uh, also seems to know uh, have have a number of of substantial contacts that give him information. How they do that through the the sort of chain of 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 in within from within you know prisons etc. Um, I don't know. But I can say that that he is uh, he is he is knowledgeable about these things. Well, you know, you have to look at uh, this guy as, as what he is, and you know, not only is he a resource to you, but I imagine that he's also a resource to the people who run the secret space program. And uh, if they want him, if they want his advice, his expertise, his insights, they're going to have to provide him with with accurate information so he can tell them what his opinions are on, on such issues. So I, I think that he's probably still in the loop. I think he's probably still getting fed. And uh, I, I, they may not be giving him the whole picture, but I think that the more of the picture they can give him, the, the, the more accurate of an opinion or advice he can offer back to them. That That's just uh, me, me Yeah, talking. well, that's true. And I can also say, though, he is, uh, he, as I said, he's a remote viewer. He's also highly telepathic. And uh, be, by, as a consequence of that, he gets information in some unconventional ways, you might say. He's also uh, telepathically, at the very least, in touch with what are called the raptors, who are a, quite a telepathic race, from what I understand. Um, and they are working alongside of our military uh, in the secret space program at this time. Uh, they looked into their future and saw if they aligned themselves with us that their their race would have a more positive future. Um, therefore, they decided rather than eat us, they would uh, align with us to fight the reptoids who are, are trying to take over the planet. Now, um, the understanding I have is that they are in constant communication with Mark even at this time. So he's getting more than just you know, uh, information in, in the conventional sense that we might think of it. Okay, so what races are we aligned with and which ones are we uh, adversarial to? Let me just, just ask a, as an open-ended question like that. Well, first of all, I mean, obviously I don't know everything. And uh, and and maybe Bobby Rainman would be the best person to ask that question too. But... Uh, well, but I... I, I I've got a contact who's related to him, so I may reach out and see what I can come up that with. That would be awesome, uh, you know, given my regards. I, I don't know. Somebody, some, a couple of people have said uh, he's he's one of the good guys. That's how they phrased it. I don't know whether that's true or not. I think it's possible. Um, but at any rate, to to answer your question, uh, I like I said, I know the reptoids are one race that we are uh, fighting with at this time. I know that there is a race in the Pacific that um, that we have been bombing their bases. Now, I don't know if that's exactly the same race. Uh, I do believe they are reptilian. However, I don't necessarily think they're related specifically to the to the reptoids that are that have bases um, that are more maybe land based. You might say. Um, but uh, you know, so it, is, it, is this I, the race that we that we had the big conflict in the Pacific with? Yes. So, and, and from what okay, I understand, okay, okay, because that that, that, that would, yeah, that continues. Uh, and there are other races. Uh, the Greys. There are many races. Okay, first of all, there are the races, the race, so-called race of Greys, that are programmable life forms. In other words, robots. Um, they do uh, the bidding of various races. Apparently, the Nordics or so-called Nordics are many races. And they're not all um, positively aligned with humans. So that's an important cautionary note. Um, there are races of greys who are positive and races of greys that are negatively based. Um, there are all kinds of various races, some insectoids, some humanoids, um, etc. So, you know, uh, it, it's interesting. I, I, I saw that... Duff had written that, you know, the movies Men in Black weren't so far off the, the point. Um, you know, I've heard that many times, and actually it, it appears to be relatively true. In other words, I can't tell you who are all our friends and, and who are all our enemies, because I don't know. In fact, I don't think our military knows, and this gets into why they surveil uh, people. 
Gotcha, gotcha. All right, well, we've got our next break. We'll be right back uh, in a couple minutes. More with Carrie Cassidy of Project Camelot. Stick with us, folks. Be back in a couple minutes. Good afternoon. Welcome back. This is Mike Harris on Revolution Radio. Today is Tuesday, November 11th, 2014. My guest today is Kerry Cassidy. And, and for people out there who want to know, today is the day that Israel attacked the USS Liberty. Just want to let you know that. You know, just uh, for for those of you who uh, who uh, have long memories and, and want to want to know what's happened in the world on this day. So, uh, Kerry, welcome back. Kerry. Hi. Yes. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> oh shoot! I'm just just picking on you. Anyway, you know, uh, we're, we've got a, we have about you know 24 minutes left, and you know, it, it wouldn't be a Carrie Cassidy interview on my show unless I turned it over to you and allowed you to ask me questions because uh, <laughs> that that you 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 tend to do the interview at jujitsu better than anybody else I know. <laughs> Well, uh, sure. I'm, I'm happy to spread <laughs> things around. I mean, uh, you know, in light of, of the current status, what do, you, what do you know? What are you hearing? Because uh, I, you usually get some back channel information. Uh, there are a lot of people out there that are kind of nervous. I don't know if you heard the Michio Kaku uh, announcement saying this happened. Someone played it for me. I didn't hear the whole thing, but apparently he was saying there was going to be a something like a solar storm it sounded like um and that it was going to impact uh the united states for one thing it, and he said it was going to be at its height around november 13th uh and that as a consequence we were going to get ice um not ice but i guess uh, very cold fronts coming in uh there is a change in the weather right now today uh we're a few days ahead of the 13th um, I don't know if that's an indication of what he was talking about. I don't know. Have you heard anything about that? Well, I, I know that we've got some unseasonable weather uh, coming down. We're, we're looking at temperatures in the Midwest going to be 40 degrees below what is the normal lows for this time of year. This is going to be a real, a real blast of cold air coming in. And so uh, I, I know that for a fact. I've been looking at this suspiciously uh, because you know the harp related technology has been always they they try to heat the air to cause effects well the, the group that i've been working with on on weather control technology has been cooling the air super cooling the air and i think we we may have tipped our hand a little bit too much that uh, other people are beginning to figure out the, the the techniques and the technologies behind this that's a concern of mine uh so you know we we know how we can make the air super cold it's it's a vortex type uh technology how you manipulate the vortex and and impact that but uh, you know, I, I haven't heard about the solar storm. I know that we're we're prepared for them. And one thing that bothers me is for for less than two billion dollars, the U.S. government could harden all of our uh, our transmission stations, our um, you know, for uh, our power grid out there, harden the grid so that we wouldn't have to worry about uh, a, a solar storm uh, like they had that. Uh, what was it, 1860s? They had that uh, that event that caused the telephone uh, telegraph lines all to fry. Uh, you know, for for less than two billion dollars, we could protect all that, and uh, the government's done nothing to prepare for it. And that that is a a disappointment to me. That uh, they, they kind of want to hang us out here a little bit. Uh, okay, well, that's interesting. When you say the government, you know, I, of course, I'm, I, it's never the government to me. Uh, we have to decide which government we're talking about, the one on the surface or the one behind the scenes. Uh, and therefore, the information may be, um, may be misleading. I can say that they have protected themselves and that they, they are working on protecting themselves, in fact. Um, there's an interesting thing that Mark also talked about that does tally in with this that has to do with something I was talking to Paul LaViolette about, which has to do with a, uh, a, a sort of, well, what in essence it seems to be a gas cloud that is now entered into the area of the galactic center, what uh, is also called Sagittarius A. Um, and apparently it that gas cloud, according to Mark Richards, contains what he calls our um, birthing planets, planets that are uh, the size of Jupiter and stars and that in the process uh, there, there's concern in the um, the not surface government uh, that uh, there may be a, therefore a reaction within the galactic center that is what 
Mark, uh, I mean, what Paul LaViolette has been talking about now for several years, which is a, a potential uh, galactic superwave event. Now, if that was to happen or has already started and we don't know about it or be, aren't being told, um, it could be accounting, it could account for the, uh, the recent solar storms coming from the sun and our changes, the changes we see in the solar system that have been happening for a number of years now, as well as the energetics impacting Earth. Are we protected is the next question. Um, that's, that's a perfectly decent question. Uh, I think that there are many things that may be operational around that. One of them has to do with an activation of the pyramids on planet Earth. And I ran this idea by both Paul LaViolette and Mark Richards. Paul LaViolette seemed to uh, not think that it had much merit, or at least uh, it, in, in the investigations he's done. Um, I, because I was in Egypt on 2012, I have clearly seen uh, energy going directly out of or into the Great Pyramid, uh, you know, a very, very strong energy beam. And I have uh, what is called etheric sight. So I am able to see certain things that I know that some other people can't, although um, I don't think it was that hard to see, to be honest. Uh, at least in Egypt, certainly around 2012, it was was very strong, but I've seen it in the past as well. Um, and I've been to Egypt four times now. Um, so, but they're also discovering new pyramids, uh, under sea and on the earth as we speak. Mm -hmm. And there is some thought that there may be an activation taking place. Mark referenced that harp, contrary to what people understand, is actually underground, a, formed like a pyramid. And that relates directly to the potential to create what is in essence a shield for planet Earth uh, that may be being uh, sort of um, energetically activated at this time. Something that we don't know is happening, uh, but is potentially could be happening. Uh, Mark seemed to think it, it had some validity. Um, I want to get into more discussions on, with Paul LaViolette about this uh, because he was questioning it. Uh, I think he's just looking for, you know, he's a scientist. He's looking for hard evidence. I don't have that for him, so I'm not sure whether we'll be able to proceed down that discussion. But but I can say that, um, that you know, the evidence on Earth is that something strange is going on. <laughs> that much we're, we're, we're obviously seeing. Um, and that weather is very, very odd. Uh, here in California, of course, we're having a drought. And uh, I was also in touch with Richard Allen Miller. Many people will know his name, and, and you, you're friends with him as well. Um, we've been talking, and I've been talking to him. Uh, he's talked about, you know, the Fukushima, the radiation from Fukushima. I was thinking that uh, they may not be um, having it rain in California because they do not want to bring down to the ground the, the radiation, uh, the, radiation uh, the hard stuff that could infect the groundwater and the crops. So they may purposely be causing uh, that, keeping that from from landing here and hoping that it it goes uh, past California, which is highly populated, into the less populated areas of the desert, say Nevada, Utah, etc., um, by air currents. Now, that's that's currently just a, a theory of mine, but I, I think it possibly has merit. Um, I know that, that, that there's no doubt about the, the drought. Of course, that's highly uh, publicized. So, But it's, it's, it's interesting because you know that they have control of the weather, so they can make it rain whenever they want, um, wherever they want. And uh, they also have weather wars. So we, when we have wars with various countries, China included, um, there are earthquakes in interesting places, and uh, those earthquakes are are, are triggered. And uh, and this has been going on for a while. And Fukushima, notwithstanding, of course. So uh, so this is this is where all that leads. Um, you know. Do you have anything to add to that? <laughs> well, that, that 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 that's a handful, and we know that that, that the weather is is controllable. We we beyond a shadow of a doubt, we've got that one. We got that one nailed. Now, who's in control and and to what end is what seems to be a mystery. Because, um, you know, I I hadn't considered previously that they might be, uh, um, you know, trying to to deposit the radiation from Fukushima um, somewhere else other than the fertile California Central Valley. Uh, 
but they're 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 killing the businesses down there. And and if 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 they would just talk to us and say, look, Fukushima is a problem. We don't have control over it. We we need to divert the rainfall from Fukush uh, from uh, California to somewhere else. A lot of people, I think, would understand and, and be sympathetic toward it. But the fact that they keep us in the dark um, really is frustrating. And it, you know, if people don't know what to believe or who to trust. I do notice that you know I've, I've had to drive uh, from Oregon down into California several times. Mount Shasta finally has a decent snowpack on it, but Lake Shasta is is nothing more than a than a puddle right now. And uh, but the the thing that's odd about that Lake Shasta being at such a low level is that all the northern uh, riverways, you have the Sacramento River, the American River, uh, the Shasta River, they're all full to the bank, so they're not even trying to to hold back that uh, uh, any of the water for, for any reserves at all. They're, 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 they're as full as can be. The rivers are flowing briskly. And that, that just puzzles me. Yeah, that's that's fascinating, uh, and, and thank you for raising that. I have to say that uh, that is very interesting. It kind of um, belies. I'm also puzzled by something in my area because with the drought, you would expect more plants to be dying. I don't see those plants dying. I don't see trees being adversely affected. Now, I think that what we've got is groundwater that is flowing. And, uh, of course, a tree has deep roots and so on. And so... Uh, they may not be uh, at, as much at risk as we think they are. It's it's an interesting uh, question. I can say I recently went to Sedona, and the place is very dry. But Sedona has substantial groundwater. Um, and this is known by the Native Americans and something that I was told uh, directly uh, at, at one, one of my trips there. And... And, and that's really interesting because uh, then you're dealing with something else entirely. And, uh, again, it's manipulation. So, um, you know, look, I'm glad to hear that there is some snowfall on Shasta. Again, there is an ET race called the Telos people that have been uh, imprisoned there and are um, fighting a battle with the reptoid, a reptilian species, which I imagine is the reptoids, although I don't know that for a fact. Um I certainly know they're reptilian. Uh, I went up there and spoke, uh, I think it was in 2010 on the solstice, if I recall, if I have that, that year right. Um, and it was a very evident to me, uh, the battle going on. I was communicated with telepathically by that race while I was there, something I didn't expect at all. In fact, I didn't even consciously know the name of the race. Um, but all that came through uh, while I was there and basically... Um, it's a it's a very dire situation. I have had conversations with um, other whistleblowers about this, and uh, they do say that 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 that's quite true. That area has been taken over, and has was taken over a while ago. There are some efforts to uh, to, to 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 win it back, um, and uh, and and that's as much as I know about it. Well, I, I don't know if you know this or not, but uh, this summer up until uh, probably late October, uh, Shasta had no snow on it. It, 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 it was a bare rock, and I'd wow. never seen Shasta like that. And, and uh, the number of years I've seen it, I, I'd never seen it that dry, that uh, that that set back. And so, you know, seeing a, a healthy coating of snow on it was, was really, really uh, a good thing, particularly this early in the year. Absolutely. So. Well, good to hear. Uh I mean, it is interesting, you know, watching our weather and the fact that you know, once you know they're manipulating this stuff, and of course the chemtrails are part of that puzzle, right? Because they are uh, all they do is they they create the chemtrails, and a few hours later your your sky is covered with clouds, and then it may or may not rain, um, and and that's been going on for many many years. So um, and and very well documented, I must say. So. Uh, you know, this is what we're dealing with. Uh, as to get back to the question, are we protected? Um, I also think that the Hadron Collider, uh, is, is, is operational in terms of what they are working on to create, um, again, to get back to the wing makers material. And uh, a lot of people, I believe, did follow or do follow the wingmakers.com information, uh, 
the principal there is James, is called James. I've been in touch with him. I've conducted uh, two very long interviews in writing with him, which are on the Camelot website. Um, but at any rate, he uh, he he talked about this blank slate technology, as he called it, that the government wanted to put into place. It is a stealth technology, and there is some thought that they are uh, trying to operationally move Earth into a um, interdimensionally. Uh, at least for a period of time uh, in order to avoid certain um, sort of negative things going on in our galaxy. Now, I I don't know that they're going to be successful in that. And I don't even know if, if that has been, uh, if they continue to, to try to do that. But <laughs> it's my cat. Um, so uh, there, but but it, at any rate, there there is a lot of information on the Wingmakers site about that effort um, for those that are interested. Okay, I'm just responding to some some questions here from from listeners about uh, you know who are the players messing with the weather, and I'm aware of at least three different groups that that have got weather technology, and um, just just had to pass that along. That's all. Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, you both, we both know the Russians. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting because you have to deal with the playing field that we're, we're on here and, uh, we're, we're friends with the Russians behind the scenes, even though there's, uh, supposedly supposed to be, um, a colder war happening <laughs> at the moment. Uh, and, and because we're working with them very closely in the sp- secret space program. I mean, keep, you know, I, I just have to say that we're aligned with beings, um, uh, that are human because we are human and therefore we have, we may have a common enemy. There is reason for us to work together, uh, as you can appreciate, uh, if we want to see our species thrive and, and in fact do more than survive, but thrive. So, um, so the question becomes, you know, who's doing what now? Certainly the Chinese have weather, weather war, uh, capability. And I know Gordon Duff has, has highlighted this. So we know the Russians do, we know the Chinese do, we certainly do. Um, you know, and the UK, you, you have to lump the UK and the United States together as well as Australia. Those three countries, um, are, uh, like white on rice, so to speak, um, all, all very aligned, uh, which isn't to say that from time to time they don't do something nefarious, uh, <laughs> the other one might not be aware of completely, but, uh, but that's the way it seems to be played. And to some degree, from what I understand, Canada is is part of that um, sort of group, and there may be some other uh, other countries out there that are also um, conscious members. There's also um, Antarctica. I mean, let's not forget the the huge Nazi base in Antarctica because that's just uh, major, and uh, it is is staffed, of course, with uh, with some of the Nazis that came over on paperclip. Some of whom, uh, if you saw my time travel conference, have been reverse aged. So they are still alive and, uh, they, they may appear younger. They may actually be younger than, uh, than they were during World War II, in fact. So this is a, a key concept to wrap your mind around that. So let, let, me, let, me, have, let, me, let me, let me toss something out there on that because the, the, this is an interesting topic and I'm not going to, not going to disclose what I know right now. But just let me say this about that. If you could have a guy who has, if you were a Nazi, you'd have to be like 120, 125 years old right now. If you could go back to, to being, uh, having your, your, your peak body at 24, 25 years old with all of that 100 plus years of life experience, do you know what kind of incredible advantages you would have on everyone else around you because of your, um, you know, how much more life experience you have? Uh, amazing advantages. Let's just say that. Uh, no doubt about it, and apparently that's going on as we speak. Uh, there are a number of Nazis. That Mark even uh, Mark Richards had in my last interview uh, verified this information. And what I'm doing actually today is releasing for free uh, my my lecture that I, I gave at my time travel conference, which was a little over a, actually a year and a half ago. Um, right up to now, we've been selling these, uh, you know, for very low price, like five dollars to stream or whatever, on the net. But uh, I'm going to release it for free on YouTube today because I want people to get this information, and uh, and so we're going to use it as a promo because that those uh, those lectures we had um, 
nine speakers, I think it was in total, stellar, stellar individuals, uh, all talking about time travel. People like Preston Nichols, who knows whereof he speaks, who was involved in the Montauk project, and uh, certainly uh, David Wilcock and, and many others, Richard Hoagland, as usual. Um, you know, very important, important lectures, but uh, I am releasing mine, which is all about the testimony I got from behind the scenes from a young man who lived in the Pacific Northwest, who, from what I understand of my last contact with him, is writing a book on this subject, who was exposed directly to uh, to a, a reverse-aged Werner von Braun, who was, in fact, his biological father, and uh, and more. So, so this is a, a huge, um, undisclosed bit of information that uh, I disclosed at my conference, and that this young man came forward to me. Uh, we had an in-depth conversation, and then he he basically disappeared. So, uh, very important stuff. So well, it is, and, and this is something that is going to be getting a lot more attention here in the near term. Uh, the ability to rejuvenate, uh, if you will, aged bodies and, and, you know, take what has become a disordered mass and, and restoring it to a earlier state of, of more ordered. Uh, that, that's really, it's, it's, it goes to do conjugated waveforms and I'm not going to say much more about it, but it's something that, uh, that we're, mm-hmm. we're, we're tracking and watching and, and trying to assist along at, at every opportunity. Excellent. Well, let me say just before we end this show, I, I am going to be leaving on Friday to speak in Australia at the Ambush Gallery uh, and then China at the UFO Congress in China, uh, well, Hong Kong, and uh, that'll be on November 30th. I'll be at the Ambush Gallery the 21st, 22nd, and 23rd. I'll be doing two very long lectures uh, on Saturday and Sunday there and doing a meet and greet. I may be broadcasting live on the Friday night assuming we can get the technology happening. So please stay tuned to Camelot for that. Um, I just want to say to everyone that I'm having to pay my own flight over there. Uh, they paid part of my flight, but I have to pay the rest. Um, so any donations are much appreciated to make this trip possible. Uh, I think it goes without saying how important it is to connect with people uh, in other countries around the world that uh, we are far away from here in the United States. So uh, this is important outreach. Well, you know, hit, go to Project Camelot, hit the donate button, folks. Help carry out. Go to uh, go to uh, uh, Freedom Slips, hit the donate button. Help us out too. We, we all need to stay on the air. One last thing before you go, Carrie, and that is, uh, you've heard that Mr. Jakesh and his family were poisoned. Uh, we're, we're tracking that very carefully, and as this develops, we'll we'll, we'll share this with the listeners uh, I'm as we learn. Live broadcast very likely tomorrow and the next day with Cash. Okay, very good. Carrie, thank you so much for joining us. Have a safe trip and stay in touch, okay? okay? All right, thank you so much. All right, All right. bye-bye, everybody. Bye. You're listening to Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. We'll be right back after this message.